Okay, so let's continue the session. Now we have uh, Kondwani uh, from Malawi, and he will uh, tell us more about FOSS technologies in modeling spatial accessibility of primary healthcare in Malawi. So the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like, like you said, I'm Kondwan from Malawi, and I'll be presenting on behalf of my colleague who couldn't make it, but we are presenting on a, um, a thesis, a part of a thesis that uh, Yemika and Ozaki are working on, which is uh, technologies, uh, force technologies in modeling spatial accessibility of primary health care. Um, so I will take you through um, that particular list, but um, in terms of introducing the, um, the topic, um, I'll just go straight into healthcare accessibility, which is the, um, the opportunity or ease with which communities uh, can timely use appropriate health services in proportion to their needs. And there are push-pull factors around this, including demand um, and supply. In this case, spatial accessibility combines uh, both availability and also um, geographic um, access. And the relationship between the um, available uh, healthcare services and the population that is being targeted to access that particular service. And spatial accessibility modeling in our case now is an important uh, step in policy making and improved decision making for communities and st uh, states like um, uh, Malawi it, it would be in this particular case. So let me just elaborate to say that um, um, we, we decided to go in, uh, in this particular direction because um, we would want to at least have some proper um, scientific basis of determining to say, okay, um, uh, this population has access to healthcare um, or not. So the need for us to provide equal and access uh, to pri primary healthcare, I mean, we all understand why that is important. But for our case, the approaches that are informing the decision-making process itself um, to improve the access are facing a number of um, challenges, uh, specifically in the developing world. In some cases, ICT has actually been incorporated, but if you talk of proprietary software, some of the uh, challenges are that it can actually be prohibitively um, uh, expensive both directly and um, indirectly. So in this particular case, the idea was now to try and explore uh, the confluence of uh, um, force uh, on spatial accessibility tools and also healthcare delivery so that we'll be able now to inform the decision making in terms of primary healthcare. But we are now not looking at the whole of the country, but for a district um, in uh, Malawi. So in terms of how healthcare is delivered, um, we are looking at uh, the Minister of Health, which provides the health services through both promotive and preventive at the lowest level, and it rises all the way up to tertiary uh, and specialist training, um, specialist uh, care. But 70% of the services still are at the um, uh, lowest primary and secondary levels largely due to poor gatekeeping at the um, higher levels. And at policy level, um, the ministry defines accessibility as a, um, um, a, a Euclidean distance. So they set up an eight kilometer radius and say, anybody who is within eight kilometers of a certain health facility could be considered to be um, having access to healthcare. But we know um, that that may not be exactly um, true. And based on that, um, the health sector strategic plan for 2017 and 2022 actually populates or suggests that 90% of the people in Malawi have actually um, access. And we are saying this may not necessarily be um, true. So there are some direct and indirect costs that are being experienced for people to actually access the, um, the health facilities, particularly in the rural areas. And already the demographic health uh, health survey reports that about 50% of the women have struggles to access health care and most of them they actually cite uh, distance as a major barrier. So like I've said this is part of work that was uh, being done and the, the whole presentation here will focus on evaluating the special tools that uh, were actually being used in uh, coming up with the primary healthcare accessibility model. And uh, the study area is, um, uh, that's where Malawi is located, and we have three neighbors, Tanzania, Zambia, 
and uh, Mozambique. And this is the district, so it's the, in the southern part uh, of Malawi. I'll take you through the methodology. Um, the, the bigger scheme uh, of the methodology um, had three components. So we have part A, part B, and then I'll also talk about uh, part C. But primarily, we had the basic um, uh, functionalities. Um, and the, at the center of it all, we had the uh, PG routing as an algorithm that was running uh, PG Jixtra um, cost and also slope. So we had to prepare the data. Um, here we are exploding uh, the data to about 20 meters so that we make sure that um, because we'll be accessing the uh, accessibility in terms of where the hospital is or where the household is to the road network, so we need to make sure that at least we improve the accuracy to make sure that if the segment is 100 kilometers long, then the next node on that road will be 100 kilometers away. If the, so we had to reduce that to at least try and make sure it's close enough. And then we also wanted to incorporate um, elevation. So we, for each node, we had to overlay it with a DM and then get the uh, elevation for that particular point. And then what the algorithm was doing now is to make to calculate, for example, and identify the vertices on the road network that are closest to a facility. Um, and we use the um, post GIS functions of ST distance and also the aggregate functions in SQL for us to be able to come up with a list of um, uh, these vertices. And then we had to calculate the travel path cost uh, so that we are now able to determine which particular point can actually access which particular health facility uh, to every other node within the eight kilometer as prescribed. And here we use the uh, Jixtra uh, algorithm as specified in PG um, routing. Plus we attached a cost uh, through the elevation data that uh, we had. Uh, after that, now we had to calculate the cheapest route for the household to travel. Because there are several facilities that the household could actually travel, and there are also several alternatives that they can actually go through, we had to, ask to at least determine the cheapest route. So we're determining, because there are several households, I think uh, our, for the area we had about 139,000 households. Computationally, that meant a lot of processing. But because we are running it on the standard computers, we had to optimize by uh, subsetting the operations. So we're using for every household within eight kilometer radius and the network, uh, we're generating the network vessels that are within that eight kilometer radius and their travel uh, cost to a facility. And then for each of those households, we are now identifying the cheapest uh, vertex closest to it and that is now within a kilometer. You may be wondering why we are switching between the radiuses. It's purely on computational basis. If you let it search more than one kilometer, then it may never, um, or it could get to the uh, result, but it may take forever. So that's just one way. Now, once we had prepared the data in this particular case, now we had to pass it through um, the spatial accessibility uh, model itself. And in this case, we use the two-step floating catchment area, um, which essentially creates two floats. There's a service catchment, which says for each service, um, which is located at a certain location, you need to find all the households, um, which will now um, uh, mount to the population that is within that particular threshold time, and then locate, um, uh, uh, or that, that are located at that particular location, and then calculate the population to provider ratio and represented by that particular um, mathematical uh, equation there. And then the second step is now to generate or to calculate the population for the catchment. So for each population that we have generated, you need now to find all the services um, that fall within a threshold time uh, accessible at location I and then sum the populations to provide the ratios from that uh, step one. Uh, we added uh, a Gaussian, so the TFC uh, in itself is more categorical. So we added um, uh, a Gaussian continuous decay function so that even though the households could be within similar location, but the accessibility could actually be spread 
and be more continuous than, ra than rather than being discrete in terms of uh, time steps. So as AI increases, um, then which is the accessibility for the households, then the accessibility for the household is also increasing. So overall, that's the methodology, uh, parts A, B, and then the actual spatial accessibility um, uh, as represented. In terms of the results, for process 1A, uh, in which case we are now looking at calculating the facility to um, um, distance to the nearest vertex, because we had to explore uh, the distances, we are now limited to about uh, an average of 113 uh, meters for all the uh, 41 health facilities that we have in the uh, study area. But now for us to be able to reduce the, respect, uh, the search space to identify the vertices again, we had to limit it to about 400 meters. And this 400 meters is generated or was actually arrived at when we compared the road data, the road network data for the road, the maximum distance for each facility to a road network before exploding was about 300 something meters. Therefore, we concluded that even if we explored, there is no way um, there could be a facility that could exceed. Uh, so we took the next 100, which was now uh, 400. So in terms of the distances, so we did two um, travel distances traveling without taking elevation into consideration or slope. And this was the average distances that we were actually getting, about 5.2 uh, kilometers. If you factor in the elevation, then the distances were actually coming to about uh, 5.23. Uh, so there isn't really much of a difference, but the implications uh, would be seen as um, I move on. Now, when you look at an individual health facility, for example, uh, like I said, the policy says you have, you have to be within eight kilometers to a health facility for you to be considered to have access to health services. So we had to do some analysis to say, okay, for example, if you look at that particular health facility, within the eight kilometer radius, you could actually have all these particular um, um, households. But between six and eight kilometers, you're actually finding that you have about 6,000 households. And 71% of these households, we are actually traveling more than eight kilometers. So using the road network that we have here, if somebody is staying somewhere here, for them to travel to get to that particular health facility, even though they're within eight kilometers, they're actually traveling more than uh, eight kilometers. So that's, this scenario is actually occurring for almost every, every other facility that we have um, in there. Now, for us to standardize um, what we're doing, what we did now next was to say, okay, what are the recommended parameters that we can actually now begin to compare and say, okay, this is the case for um, our study area. So we adopted the uh, travel, time distance, uh, travel time measure rather than just looking at distance, even though we incorporated slope. Because the advantage is with time, you are now including even the mode of transport that the people are actually going to be um, using. So we adopted a one hour threshold because most of the um, research that we uh, studied, they were actually looking at a one hour uh, threshold. And this one hour threshold translates to uh, a travel distance of about five kilometers, whichever mode of transport um, you, you take into consideration. If you have to travel more than five kilometers within the one hour, whatever mode you're using, then you are actually having poor access to health facilities. When we did that, what transpired was that about 39% uh, percent of the population was actually could be considered not to have access to um, uh, healthcare. And the distributions in terms of uh, urban and rural, because the population was combined, if you look at the urban situation, about 99.9% .9 of the people are actually having access, are within the uh, five kilometer uh, travel distance. But only um, about 55 or so percent in the rural areas. And the average of the two is the one that is now coming to about 39%. Uh, when you now consider time, you find that about 59% of the households 
have access to health care within an hour or 60 minutes. And in the urban, again, uh, we have about 99%, but in the rural, it's only 53.4. Uh, so this, to some extent, agrees with the, what the um, district health survey had identified to say about 56% of the households. And this was only looking at uh, women uh, were actually having uh, struggles to access uh, health care, which is far much lower in both cases than what the Ministry would have actually been reporting at that particular time, indicating that we have about 90% accessibility. Again, of notice is that almost all households in the urban areas are actually having um, a health facility within an hour. And what is surprising, or not necessarily sur not, not exactly surprising, is that for all the households in the urban areas, they have actually at least access to at least five facilities. While in the rural areas, the only 34% of the people have access to at most one, and uh, um, 43%, uh, sorry, 40, 43 has access to at most one, and then 34% have access to at most two, respectively. So they, they are really, um, there's a really very big disparity in between uh, what is happening for the rural and urban situation. Now, to, to look at the distribution in terms of um, uh, a map, we now had to come up with a map indicating the distances for the households. Um, so the map on the left is covering the facilities. So everywhere where you have um, some uh, circle or ring towards a certain particular color, uh, in this case, the light green at the center there, that's where the active facility is. And then the spanning out indicates the distances as you move out. So you'll notice that for the um, model scores, there are about um, uh, more than one facility could actually be accessed within um, 60 kilometers. So you have a higher score if you can access at least one facility in a, uh, within uh, a kilometer, uh, sorry, within uh, an hour. The highest scores that we noted, apart from the urban areas, but we also noted one for an island health facility, largely because it has um, a low population, because the model is looking at not just the number of people, uh, but also the type of services that are actually being offered at that particular time. So the fewer the people, the higher the accessibility would be uh, um, assumed. We also had the very high scores for the boundary um, uh, facilitators, and the reason is largely because of the edge effect. For the facilitators that are on the edges, they are actually saving other households that are in the neighboring districts. But because we had taken them out, uh, it's now reducing the number of people that are, so it would, um, it's now affecting how the, uh, the model is actually going to, um, to behave. So in the final uh, analysis, we are looking at uh, if you have to increase equitable uh, access to and also improve the quality of the healthcare services, we need to have sound and uh, formal assessments of access to healthcare, service coverage, and also detailed analysis of the underserved population. In which case, in the absence of such uh, analysis, then critical decisions tend to be made more on political rather than pragmatic uh, considerations, and most of the times with very far less uh, optimal results. And uh, to conclude, we've tried to at least provide an arguably uh, spatially objective accessibility model uh, to inform the policy direction, and it reveals that the healthcare accessibility is not as rosy as is being indicated by um, the ministry, and it's actually far much lower. And more importantly, we're also able to highlight um, the usefulness of um, free and open source technologies in the developing world. Um, it has actually provided us cost-effective um, ass uh, assessments um, but more importantly, we are able to do, um, it, was, it was able to facilitate for us an incremental uh, setup of the model. Uh, you may not fully appreciate this, but if you have very limited processing on your computers, um, 
you need to have ways in which you can actually have your models running uh, incrementally, little by little, until you get your final result. Because if you lump everything together, then your computer will crash, or you not even uh, you not even be able to to get your uh, your result. But more importantly, again, we also were able to do this persistently, and this is important because you, uh, for some of you that have been um, in Africa or in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, you you notice that power is an issue. So you can't have a model that will run for three or four hours because the chances of having a power blackout um, could, be, uh, could be there. So you, because we're able to run this on, uh, against a back, uh, back end of PostGIS, which is a persistent uh, data storage engine, we could come back and resume from where it stopped from. So, um, so this looks simple here, but it's really something that could go a long way in um, uh, doing. So if this could be done at one district level, then if you have to scale it up and look at the whole nation, then it's actually possible, even though it may take longer, but at least you know you can circumvent some of these particular uh, problems. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Konwani. Are there any questions? One second, so this is yours. Hello. Uh, first of all, all my compliments for this very interesting study. Uh, I do something similar, so I really appreciated the approach that you made, uh, the statistical modeling. It's very impressive, my compliments. Uh, I got two questions. Uh, yes. The first one is, uh, how do you distinguish between uh, urban and rural areas? I mean, do you use a custom function or is a threshold uh, for the analysis? Uh, uh, how do you distinguish between the two, the two areas? And the second one, uh, have you considered maybe as a future development uh, to see for this from the opposite perspective, so no, uh, not to uh, analyze the, the coverage of hospitals, but to analyze the demand. So uh, try to look what are the areas according to the population, and also if you have any health-related data to the risk uh, of diseases, uh, what are the critical areas in which the demand is super high, but the coverage is the poorest? All right, um, thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, just I'll start with the second part um, because I've forgotten the first one. <laughs> um, it, how how do we? Okay, have you thought about getting to um, the demand aspect? Yes, like I've said, this is uh, part of the the work that is being done. But what we also did uh, beyond this was to say, okay, this is the situation. But now, how then do we move forward? Where is, okay, we have identified these areas to be having very poor uh, accessibility. What next? So we did run some um, um, analysis where we use the grid algorithm. We are not so sure, okay, we, are, we didn't really add a lot of options there, but uh, to at least now determine where next, uh, if you have to, do, to come up with another facility, where next would, should you actually uh, be putting it? So we did, uh, do that, but it's not part of the presentation. Uh, just remind me the first person again. Uh, how did you distinguish between uh, urban and rural areas? Oh, rural and urban areas. Uh, well, I think that was we. Okay, we the the study area is divided into several. Um, um, I would say wards, and the wards belong to either urban and rural. So we just run the model completely and then decide, okay, using the, just overlaid with the urban and, uh, and rural six sections and determined that these are in urban, these are in rural. So there wasn't any, anything specific in the modeling itself. It was just purely overlay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, congratulations. Thank it's you. It's a very interesting uh, work. Uh, my question refers more to the data. So what yes. was the accuracy of the data? So which kind of data? Did you use some authoritative data or open source data? And which, which is the accuracy? Because this is also very relevant when you want to apply to a model. Yeah, um, it, so the, the data, the critical data here is one, the population, like 
the locations of the households, number one. Number two is on the road network itself. Unfortunately, um, the, the, for example, the open sources are not very detailed for our, our country. We are hoping to actually work on that and, the, and improve, for example. So you couldn't go to OpenStreetMap and get as detailed data as you'd have. So what we did is we went to the surveying department, so we are at least able to get the detailed road network uh, for our country to the lowest level uh, possible. So we use that particular data and run. In terms of uh, the exact location, we use the census data for the population. Uh, as you might be aware, the census data doesn't actually give you exact locations. So what we did was to get the numbers and then try and randomize. Of course, we must out um, all the other areas where we know people can't live. So if it's a forest, uh, we, we, we couldn't randomize into those uh, areas. So that's how we handled But the actual number of households is as per the census population. But the exact location and distribution is not exactly as the per the census because we couldn't get that data. Thank you. Yes, there's another hand there. Hi, yeah, great presentation. Um, Thank you. This is really to follow up on that question because um, when did you do the study? Um, this was done uh, uh, earlier this year. Did you use the latest 2018 census? Unfortunately, we couldn't yeah. because uh, um, we couldn't get access of the, um, to, to, to the data. So we used the, um, the, the 2008 population census data and with projections project. yeah. to yeah. 2018. Now, excellent. It'd be great to run the, again yep. with the latest because also what the NSO, uh, National Statistics Office in Malawi, have done yes. is they've identified every dwelling as a point file. Yes. So that will increase the accuracy even more because yeah. we'll not only have the ward boundary yeah. or the enumeration boundary, yeah. but you'll actually have the physical location of a dwelling. Yeah. So uh, I think running it, I, I think it's great. I think that you've, you've got something here that you can run again with more up-to-date data, which yeah. means that suddenly your results uh, you know, will be, will be much yeah, We actually improved. tried to, to get the latest data, like two months ago, I contacted the NSO, but that's when I was told we haven't really cleaned up the data for, for to open it up. But we would definitely do that. Yeah, they've just only, they're only just releasing it. So yes, yeah. They're, they're so only just releasing the data, and yeah. some of it, like the point data for dwellings, they might not even put into the yes. public domain. Yeah. Um, an interesting thing to follow, follow this is that we're producing a rural access indicator, yeah. where we're looking at all of the population that are within two kilometers of the road network. Yeah. And we are, through the survey department and through the roads authorities, mm -hmm. we're publishing the road network on OpenStreetMap now. Yeah. And there's world population data from WorldPop, who are now going to take the latest NSO data and the produce a 100 meter, 100 meter pixel data, which yeah. means that suddenly the world can take OpenStreetMap, the world can take WorldPOP, yes. and all these NGOs and all these government organizations or whoever can then start to use this, yeah. not just for planning rural access, but for planning hospitals, for yeah. planning uh, humanitarian and all those sorts of things. So it's really interesting, your, your talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I think I've... Last question. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, yes. So I'm interested in how detailed your health facilities are, like um, where the data is. Do they have access to surgery rooms? Um, what medicine do they have? You mentioned that the statistics for women is lower. Are they reproductive health faci facilities? Like, do you do you have that information? And maybe that's like to further it in the future. Um, yes and no. Not not very detailed. And that's the more reason why we are, we are calling this primary health care. So it, it may not be uh, uh, a complicated um, service. So we're looking at the basics. If they need to, um, to, to be treated with malaria, are they able to get those things? So most of the health facilities that we have here, they actually can handle all the needs, the basic needs of primary health care. That's um, to some extent, yes. Of course, there will be some 
facilities that don't have uh, one or two things, but at least um, if, they de if somebody decides not to visit it, it would not necessarily be because they don't have the facility, but they've chosen to go somewhere else. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.